pad the whole side. I press the button. Okay. Good. Do you make an introduction because there's some some catchphrase that more starts with right. Uh, hey everyone, today is the Feb 15th. This is uh, the seventh KMS meeting. Uh, this call falls under the CNC of Code of Conduct. It's being recorded and it'll be published on YouTube. Um, and then uh, today, I think we are discussing about the performance improvements that we talked about in the last uh, couple of meetings. Um, so uh, in the Slack chat, Mo mentioned that uh, instead of going forward with the current observability cap that we have, where we talked about adding a new UID field to the gRPC API, uh, we probably can consider uh, starting to work on a V2 alpha one instead. Um, so uh, what we do is we introduce a new V2 alpha one, we add the new UID field that we talked about, and then also extend it with the new KMS key ID and the other fields that we discussed, which can be useful in terms of uh, having the multi-level hierarchy um, which can improve the call patterns and all of those. Um, so the idea was we do V2 alpha one as a POC. So we start doing work on it. Like we actually build an API and then try out everything. And then maybe also like demo it within this group. And then once we have something concrete, we convert that into a cap and then submit it to SIGOTH. And then that will, that is what we will take forward, um, with all the changes that we need instead of uh, proposing individual changes uh, in each cap, and then we won't know if it's actually extendable, right? Like the UID works one with, with V1 alpha with the current APIs, but for the newer fields, it's probably makes sense to just have a new API. So if you're gonna have a new API, we might as well just invest all our efforts and adding all the required fields in the new one, have a POC working. And then once we validate the theory, we can also show it SIGOTH. And then once we get, folks saying this looks good, we can convert that to a cap and actually go ahead and implement it. Um, and I think that, uh, at least personally, I think that makes sense. Um, we can actually spend some time on a POC. And in terms of POC, I think it's basically this new V2 alpha one, and then also the hierarchy on the provider plugin. So like these two things are the main ones. And then if we can actually implement that and show it works, then we can go forward with it. And then the next steps would be like the reference implementation and all those. But I think for POC, maybe we just have to try it out with like a single provider or something to show like it work, the theory works, what we propose. Yeah, I think we can even like write the library that we want to like the, what was the term for that? Um, the official like, implementation for the plugins that we wanted to write we can even like write that in parallel as the cap to kind of give it as a proof of concept and then yeah further improve it to like make it available to the users yeah that, that makes sense so i was wondering should we start with a doc before the poc or i mean at least i think it will be nice we can discuss what we want to do in the poc um, so that we have like a framework of things that we need to do. And then we can uh, basically take things that we can work on and um, set a, a deadline for ourselves and just do that so that we can demo it in this in this game as called maybe like in two weeks or three weeks. Like that. Yeah, I think that would make sense to at least like start by a document and I outline like what we want to change um, and exactly like outline what uh, improvement we expect um, and then yeah start with a POC maybe a bit a little POC because like there are still a lot of topics that we haven't discussed um, from the original doc so maybe there will be in the future new fields that were added maybe uh, or maybe a couple of things that will change so yeah we can start by a document and then like improve um, the POC like along the time like after every meeting basically to try to incorporate like everything that we discussed and keep it up to date with like the current state of our discussion. Uh, should we add to the current dog that we have towards the end or do you think we should just have a new dog that we can reference from here later? Um, maybe we can reuse the same but just like 
yeah, have some part where we highlight like every little pieces that we want to change. Because like right now it's more like kind of discussions and a couple of ideas that are thrown around rather than like actually like action items that we want to focus on. So yeah, maybe we can do that at the end of the, the doc so that we don't have like two docs for one improvement. Okay, sounds good. But yeah, having a POC that we like improve uh, after every meeting, after every discussion might be some like good proof of concept so that like it follows our discussion and goes into the right direction. And then like once we want to open the cap, we have like this POC on, on the side that we can show off. Yeah, I think like the one main outstanding thing even for the POC was what's the format of the data that's stored in HCD, right? So I'm, I'm, I think Damien, you had the suggestion on how we can do that. And then mm -hmm. uh, Mo had mentioned before that we should consider maybe a completely new format on how we want to do it. Uh, so I think maybe we can discuss that because that, that is a key part of the POC because the other new fields that we are adding is still just something that gets added to the API. But I think the data storage is that that is like the key part, like how we want to do it and retrieve. So if you want to do the POC, like I think we should discuss that before we do it. Yeah, makes sense. I think Mo had a suggestion for using JSON, but uh, yeah, I was a, I was a little hand wavy there, um, but but. The gist of my thought process was let's stop trying to encode a bunch of spaghetti into prefixes and instead uh, have a structured format that can grow without requiring like, like catastrophic changes basically. Because right now, every time we want to grow the thing, we're like, all right, like we have these prefixes, I guess. And we want to shove more suffixes on those prefixes, I guess. Uh, none of that sounds great. Um, so you know, you know, J JSON might not be appropriate uh, in this. I mean, but it depends on what the goals for the storage for format are. If our desire is for it to be easy to consume outside of Kubernetes, um, we're gonna have to think pretty hard because it it really then can't be just like proto buff. Uh, at least not the protobuf variation that we have today because it's specific to how the API servers work. Um, if that's not a requirement, then we could uh, we could probably just reuse the machinery we have for for protobuf and define sort of a generic wrapper type that is basically an encrypted object instead of like you know like when you store a config map, right? It's got a, the KHS00 prefix, and then it's binary protobuf data after that, which is encoded, right? So you could imagine the same thing, but the, the object is an encrypted blob instead of the actual blob. Um, so we, we could certainly try that. Um, presumably, we would then add new fields for um, things like key ID or whatever else we think uh, we want. Um, we maybe have, I'm, I'm unsure about this, but maybe we could have some fields that are basically meant to provide with the KMS plugin with like some form of storage, right? So the idea would be is like when you make a KMS call when the plugin responds, it could give you extra data with the idea being that, hey, that extra data is opaque to the API server, but when you ask the KMS plugin in the future to decrypt that data, send that back to it so it can do something with it. Uh, you know, so that could include other bits and pieces of information. Um, you know, if we wanted to make it a little bit more formal that the plugin basically is allowed to use the API server conversation as a form of durable storage if it chooses to do so. Um, it's not necessarily strictly required, but it maybe it's desirable, maybe. Um, uh, but, but I do think we, uh, at a bare minimum, we have to come up with an, an easy way to identify the encrypted data 
on disk. So that way when it's time for the API server to decode it, it can figure out who it's supposed to ask in some reasonable way. Um, and we want it to be easy to add new fields to it, ideally in backwards compatible ways. Um, we may want it consumable by external actors. That one's less clear to me. Um, what else is there? External oh, actors one has this been a requirement? Like, I mean, not, I mean, today, yes, it's not possible, right? Yeah, th th that's why I'm less sure about it, right? Like, I, what I'm thinking about is, Maybe you get into a situation where your Kubernetes infrastructure is really borked and you can't get the API server back up or whatever. And you just you just need to get the maybe some small amount of data out of there that's actually your really important data. It's, it's really about disaster recovery, right? Like is disaster recovery for this type of stuff, like figure out how to get the API server to run again and tell it to ask for the data back because it has all the code. Or is disaster recovery more about, well, yeah, no, you can reasonably write a tool that if, if it has the correct decryption keys can pull, pull the data out. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think in this regard, this whole area of Kubernetes is really immature because like it barely kind of works. So it's like, oh, I got it working. Okay, I'm just like, I'm gonna leave it alone. Like rotation and I need not even try. Like rotation is I'm gonna turn everything off force rewrite everything and turn it back on. And it's like, that's not rotation. You had downtime. <laughs> rotation with downtime is not allowed. That's, that's garbage. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, for the in, in, for a POC, I think, the, I think the hardest thing will be is coming up with the APIs and mechanisms that allow for rotation to be done um, much more dynamically than it is today. Right? Today it involves one or at least two or more KMS providers in the encryption configuration with careful orchestration of the API servers and their startups and all that. Uh, I, I would like to come up with something that pushes more of the burden onto the KMS API and lets us lets us do that with some confidence without needing API server restarts and without needing the more than one KMS plugin to be defined. Well, so you're suggesting that we, I mean, yeah, today we have to update the encryption config with two of it. And then the first one is used for encrypt and the, all of it is used for decrypt. So you're suggesting we don't even do that. Like a single plugin that's already running can handle the rotation part. Yeah, B because the act of uh, orchestrating API servers, restarting them, all of that is basically 100% infrastructure specific. It's different on AKS than GKE and OpenShift and Tanzu. And basically what that means is if you, if you say that that part is not in scope, you just can't do rotation, right? Because you don't control those aspects and you don't have enough information to control those aspects, right? Uh, and that, that's why I'm saying it has to be done in a way that requires no API server restarts and no change to the static encryption config. It has to be at runtime sort of dynamic for it to be valuable. Um, if, if you look at that original doc with Alex and Mike and others that were on there, you know, Alex was like, hey, can we like make like an entire API that like exports all of this information so like everyone can do rotation? I was like, I don't think any infrastructure provider is going to buy an API that basically has to shove all of their infrastructure details and like ability to restart the API server like into the Kubernetes API. I just just don't see that happening uh, because it sounds like a dangerous API to build. <laughs> so th that's the bit that's a little bit less clear to me, right? Like I think we would I think we would probably need to build like a, a part of the gRPC API that's like a streaming API that the API server basically subscribes to and is emitted information about like, hey, like now you need to do a rotation or something or, or, or even mm -hmm. it might be just like, hey, I just created a new key, 
right? And I need you to like be aware of the fact that I just made one. Uh, and you know, all of this has to work with uh, N API servers using N KMS plugins, all of which only have etcd as a synchronization mechanism. No other, there is no other synchronization between these entities, right? So this is not an easy problem and yeah. require like some significant effort and thought to actually make it work. Right. Uh, but uh, but I, I think this would be where we would get a ton of value. Um, yeah, but I, I wonder if it's not still too early to, to talk about that because like it will change the API, like thinking about it will most likely change the API. Um, but currently like we haven't yet solved how we want to store the data to improve the performance. Um, and I don't think uh, rotation will have an impact on that. Like the, the data format that we have in HCD shouldn't change based on rotation. Um, so like if we already like figure out like how, like what's the format of the data we want to store, then we can build on top of that and think about like, okay, let's go to the next step, uh, which is like rotation with end all performance. Now we want to see like, how do we handle rotation? And then focus on more like the API, what are the kind of contract that we need with the KMS to handle rotation and how do we do it uh, on the API server side? Yeah, I guess I, I'm less, it's less clear in my mind if you could, if you could do rotation without some support from the data format, maybe you can, I'm not sure. Just haven't thought about it long enough. Uh, I am totally willing to accept that we want to do something tractable as a starting point. So if our starting point is I just want, I just want uh, to handle performance by building one extra level of hierarchy, and I want to improve the storage format to at least allow me to encode some concept of a new uh, key encryption key ID. So that way, the plugin can figure out how to do the work it needs to do. Totally, I'm totally down for that as like a starting point. We can just say that like, we, we can basically say that, you know, this is an intermediate step that introduces a significant rotation issue because the hierarchy is on, like, isn't, is sort of unobserved by the API server, right? It, it, when it does a storage migration, it might not know that it's supposed to call the KMS plugin because of the hierarchy causing sort of like a delay in propagation. Uh, but that might be okay as a starting point, right? Like it'll at least help us figure out a storage format or the starting point at least. And yeah, at least something like we, that we can extend and reuse at least like as a starting point, like as you said, so we want it to be extended so that like we don't rely on a kind of binary format that we need to shove, uh, like we need to put like new prefixes uh, inside of, like we want a real format and then we want this format to maybe be reusable or at least like consumable by any kind of client that would need like to recover some secrets or whatever from a CD whenever like something wrong happen. We can take that as a starting point and maybe then extend it to all the other encryption mechanism to just have like a kind of a generic format across like all the encryption mechanisms. So then we can like build one client that would be dedicated to getting encrypted uh, information from its CD. That could be a starting point. And then based on that, we can like build all this uh, rotation mechanism that might update the, the format that we had in the CD. But since like we have this good starting point where we can now um, customize what we store in the CD easily, then it's, it will be easy to just change the format to match our new needs. Even if we introduce hierarchy, like, I mean, without thinking about rotation, it would be very similar to what rotation is today, right? Like, I mean, as, a, as the first step, like, even if we build in hierarchy, like as a user, if I want to rotate it, uh, the tech is not rotated. So if the locally generated keys are rotated, then the rotation is very similar to what it is today. Like, if you are given the key ID from HCD, which is encrypted, you can basically decrypt it with the existing tech, and then that would work. So I, I think as a first problem, like what Damien suggested, we solve the format and then like just have the initial API so we can validate that and then build ro with rotation on top of that to see if any other additional metadata is required. I think once we 
figure out what the storage format is going to look like and it's extensible by adding new fields then if we need new fields for rotation it should be a lot easier for us to add more like if you think that will make it easier for rotation i mean it sounds fine like i i don't think we're necessarily introducing a new problem we might be ex exasperating it a little bit but i don't necessarily know if it truly makes it that much of a difference uh, I do think there's, I think, a general desire to fix the storage format into something nicer, uh, you know. And if we want to simplify our thought process, right, we, we can just start with, it's going to look exactly like the protobuf that other resources use, like non-encrypted resources. It's just now it's going to, like, the, the protobuf resource is going to be some new encryption envelope object or whatever the hell you want to call it uh, with whatever fields obviously in there there's going to be like a cipher text field it's mm -hmm. just slice of bytes but the other fields are the important ones right like the, those are the ones that we want um i just i suspect we won't get much pushback if we just go with the proto um unless unless someone has a strong desire for us to try to use one of the more commonly used industry formats uh, I know Mike had suggested one a while back. I just don't remember what it's called. Um, but I suppose it's not. It's probably okay either way. Like, I, I don't think we're committing to anything right now. Um, so if, if we wanted to go down that route, I think that's fine. This is, so was that not to mean JWK, right? Or something like that? Uh, yeah, something you know, so it could be JWK. There was something else. I think it started with a C that I cannot remember. Uh, but yeah, so you yeah you can imagine a JWK. Right? So um, the, the you know the problem with JWK is you know it's semi you know human readable. You know it's 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 not it's not binary, right? It's not as compact as it could be. It's not as performant as it could be. Uh, and this, this particular piece of code already causes performance concerns. <laughs> so adding more performance concerns on top of it might not be what people are going to get excited about. Uh, no, I, I was just asking. I mean, protobuf is completely fine. I mean, it's not great. Like, it's it sucks as a human because you're like, I would like to know what the name of this field is. Oh, you just don't include that. You just assume I'm going to have the right type to put it into and like it's going to I'm just gonna pray that it works. <laughs> uh, but humans are not the, the main customer, right? It's it's the machines, and in the worst case, we could build some machinery around it or tooling. Yeah, and, and maybe maybe if there is a disaster recovery concern, maybe as like another thing alongside the reference uh, implementation, there's a tiny tool that. Uh, helps you just pull out, like, you know, if given a connection to etcd and a, a, a path or a prefix, it can go in and, you know, get, try to use basically a KMS plugin to like pull data out, right? So it's just basically the, mm -hmm. the back end and it, it'll help you read the data back out. Uh, um, you know, that wouldn't, that doesn't sound necessarily that hard to build. It might be useful for someone trying to like make sense of this stuff. Yeah, as long as we have the format, like it's pretty straightforward to build. The only problem is like having a good format that can be then reused. Yeah. And yeah, if yeah, we have like one tool for all the, the encryption kind, like we don't have to really care about like whether it's KMS data or like just ASCBC uh, encrypted data inside of HCD. We just have like to have this tool that will pull the encrypted data. Uh, the user will provide a key or whatever, and they will get back to whatever the data is. Uh, you did bring up an important point, though, which is we wanted to move away from AES uh, GCC, right? We wanted to use AES GCM or whatever. But the specific question there is, uh, what, what do we move to? And does the user have any control over it? Oh, you mean for KMS itself, not for all the other kind of encryption type? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, within the KMS API today, no matter what you do, 
you cannot control the fact that our data encryption keys are generated on the API server and are used via AES CBC to encrypt the data, encrypt the key, or yeah, but or, sorry, encrypt the data and then are encrypted using the KNS plugin. Uh, since you cannot influence that, uh, do we care? It's it's see it's surprisingly no one seems to have complained as far as I know. Uh, I think at the bare minimum we want GCM so that way we get you know authenticated encryption and decryption. Um, that seems like a good idea. Um, I I don't know if like like. Like, you know, I could imagine within the new storage format, there is a, a place where we state the fact that this is using AES GCM, right? Explicitly stated in the storage format. So that way, if we change it in the future, we would be changing that field somehow in a way of, even if we don't ever really realistically intend to change it, if we write it down into the storage format, we could expand the API server's capability of using new formats and new encryption mechanisms, have it be ready to read that data, and then over time migrate to some newer format, like you know, maybe secret box one day becomes FIPS certified or something. That could be a thing. Um, uh, I, and also, sorry, go ahead. And um, I thought about the problem with, with um, in case you're in restrictive states where you're not freely allowed to use strong encryption. I think in those, those cases, uh, you need to somehow share the keys with the state, right? So I think even then you can still use HGCM as long as uh, your, your state has some kind of an access key, um, then it should be legit, right? Yeah, you, you, you would have to build in like the capability into your KMS plugin to allow, like basically the hierarchy would be subverted if the, if the state wanted to subvert it. And there's nothing we can do to stop you from doing that. That's, it's not under our control. Um, and even in the future, if we do decide to support it and make it configurable, like it would still just be like a cluster property, right? Like not per individual KMS plugin. It will just be like, you set it on the API server to say like, hey, look, you're going to use GCM from now on and, and it's just an API server property. Yeah, and the, yeah, it would, it would probably be in the API server config and presumably you know, pr presumably there would be some way for the system to understand it needs to do rotation, right? If it used to use some other format, it needs to like go do that. Or, or maybe maybe it's just as easy as just doing a storage migration. And like, that's part of the, the staleness of the data, right? It could detect, oh, this data that I pulled off required this uh, kind of um, encryption mechanism. And I'm told my current mechanism is this other thing. Cool. Even though everything looks fine, I'm going to say it's stale, meaning you should do a full uh, update on the object and re-encrypt it using the latest KMS capability and the latest uh, encryption format uh, or um, uh, crypto. Uh, I, I that that configuration basically comes down to: Are we saying that this is an area that needs crypto agility? So far, the answer has been no, without necessarily much complaint. Um, I, I, I kind of lean towards we should at least encode it into our storage format, and then we have a good place if we need to revisit. But I don't, I don't feel we need to build in any crypto agility other than just using a yes to do Um I mean, once we are touching it, why not adding it? I think it, it, it's a cool thing because um, encryption is less deterministic. I mean, you can, so we know that AS and GCM is secure because no one hacked it as of now, right? So 
um, like every 10 years you have new insights, how, how you can an, increase this, the speed uh, with which you can try to crack uh, the cipher. So maybe at some point there's some surprise that AS can be now um, quickly hacked or whatever, and we need to swiftly switch to secret box or whatever. So, so it's not that bad idea, except someone comes in and says, hey, this, I don't know, one, two bytes that you need of access storage, it's, it's a big no-no. The, so I, I think I, I subscribe more to like the WireGuard ethos and less of the open VP and ethos in this, which is WireGuard's like, this is the encryption format. If it's broken, you, you're gonna rev the whole thing. You're just gonna have a new version of the everything and you're just gonna move on. Whereas open VPN is like, no, you can do anything you want and you can misconfigure it in any way you want. <laughs> uh, I, I lean str more strongly towards like, there is just a way to do it and it's the right way. And you, you don't like, there is no foot guns. You cannot pick an option that doesn't make sense. Uh, but yeah, like I, I think it comes down to is like how, how much concern and value do you place on crypto agility? Uh, yeah. Okay, so I guess Jason has more experience than me in those things. So, so when it's hard coded within WireGuard, this should be good enough for Kubernetes. Um, I mean, and no one complained about the ASCBC. So, yeah, I I I would at least want someone to complain before I built the feature. Like that that that's I think just good sort of like high level product design is someone needs to at least ask or um, you you should do product research and ask them questions to understand how they believe the system should work. If it's too technical for them to be asking for such features, right? Like most normal users cannot tell you anything about cryptography or modes or authentication and all that. Right. But, but, you know, you, you can certainly ask a user like, Hey, if like your identity provider locks a user, should they still be able to use the Kubernetes cluster? I'm pretty sure they're all going to say, well, well no, no, they shouldn't. Like, what, why are you even asking me this question? <laughs> uh, right, but that implies the capability of re revoking sessions, for example, right? Like, so yeah, user doesn't understand sessions or revoking them with cryptography, but they can enumerate that or well, believe lockout should occur. Uh, uh, okay, so I think, Anish, you had said that you were going to try to play around with some stuff this week and see what you yeah. came up with. Um, what, what, are, what are you, you know, what are you hoping uh, to do as a starting point, I guess? Yeah. Uh, so the V2 alpha one with the new field for the UID and the key ID. And then I think I was going to try out the new storage format. So I think like we talked about doing the protobuf. So I'm going to try with that. Like this is all with a new scenario without migration in mind, like how we're going to do that. But I was going to try these things and then also maybe uh, try the key hierarchy with the Azure KMS plugin. So I was going to try and stitch all these three together that we talked about and then see if we can actually have a working demo with it. Uh, so we can use that as a base and then keep building on top of that. So like, uh, I'm hoping I can have something by next Tuesday, uh, but if not, like later that week. Uh, this week is no meeting week for us, so I'm hoping I can get oh, stuff that's, done. Uh, I want a no meeting week. How do I get a no meeting week? <laughs> We've been doing this once in a while, so like I think I will have time this week. So I'm going to try and do that so that we can have some base, and then we can basically like tear that apart and say, like, hey, this doesn't work, that doesn't work, and just make incremental changes to it. Once we have a final thing, we can say, like, hey, this is what we want to do, and then convert that to a cap. Uh, but yes, hopefully by next week, I'm going to try and have this V2 alpha one and then the storage format uh, at the bare minimum, and then also try and get some changes in the Azure KMS plugin for a key hierarchy. Okay, so just in case you need help or you need an um, aspiring partner. So this week is also for, for, for OpenShift people uh, a little bit easier because we have something called Shift Week which means that we have no normal feature work and we can do catch up on things that we didn't follow up properly on. So, yeah. <laughs> so we have also a cool week uh, this time. That's, that's great. Uh, okay, yeah, I was, I was, I was gonna ask you an issue. Uh, uh, how can we help you if you're you know, going through this effort? Um, are you, 
Um, are you going to be maybe pushing any of this code to some public repo that you know we could kind of look at, maybe you know provide thoughts or feedback or just you know? Yeah, whatever changes I have, like I'll push it to my fork. So I'll actually uh, uh, post that when I do push changes, I'll post it on the Slack channel. And then uh, if you think like we can actually collaborate there, then we can just uh, do that. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, and- You are east or west coast? East, east um, west, west coast. yeah. I, I think I'm the only one. Well, me, Jordan, and David are the west coaster, or sorry, east coasters, east. and the rest, the rest of everyone basically the west coast. <laughs> Uh, so I think uh, Christoph, you and Damien only have like anything vaguely resembling reasonable overlap with me, <laughs> uh, which is unfortunate. Yeah, um, the magic of technology, right? <laughs> that you can connect people across the world. I um. So so you know, this is one track of thing. Is there is there other things that we should be exploring sort of in parallel? Um. You know, like, so, you know, we've talked, we've talked a lot about like a reference, you know, implementation, right? Is, is anyone interested in trying to start building out a reference implementation against the current API, the one that's already there to start specking out things like, um, like metrics and um, what, what's, what was the other thing? Logging. Oh, yeah, lo logging as well as, um, uh, you know, like getting it into a state where it could support something like PKCS 11, like, you know, getting that baseline there. And then, you know, um, once we start understanding the new V2 API, you know, we could start swapping out the, the V1 code for the V2 code. And maybe, uh, I, I guess the reference implementation could already today start trying to build a key hierarchy, right? It doesn't, doesn't necessarily need any of the V2 API stuff just yet. That's just to like make it better, less, less about. Um, so just, just trying to see if we could, you know, if Christoph has more time this week because he's like told, go, go do crazy stuff. Uh, I, or I, I guess that, that does remind me there was that, that, that repo, Christoph, that you had found at Google Tink, was it Tink? Is that what it's called? Maybe. Maybe it'd be worth exploring building a key hierarchy using that um, and trying to wire it up to like the PKCS 11 thing. So like you have your root hardware-based key encryption key, then you have your key encryption key hierarchy that's in memory, wired up as a KMS plugin to Kubernetes. See, if we, see what that looks like. Uh, Sounds like a nice adventure to do during the shift week. Um, yeah, I can definitely start with it and look how I proceed. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Damien, I mean, what you're doing when the shift week, do you want to join? Yeah, yeah, a big, big backlog of things to do, not gonna lie. And my shift week only started like late today, so. Kind okay, of, cool, so. Well, I was kind of unlucky. Okay, I'm just six months with Red Hat, so I don't have a big backlog. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's the beauty, right? The enjoy it while it lasts, Christoph. Like you slowly yeah. and steadily accumulate more responsibility, but your pay doesn't match the new responsibility. You're just like, why am I not being paid more? I do like ten times as much work as I started. <laughs> uh, it's all right. Um, but okay. I could definitely add previous reviewing and stuff like that if there is anything. Okay, sure. Um, I will, whenever I do something, I post it um, and let's figure out how to collaborate best. Um, so we didn't communicate that much in Slack. So uh, maybe you can increase the, uh, that amount and yeah, we see how it develops. So I'm looking through our doc, trying to remember all the things we wanted to address. Uh, performance, so we're, we're saying Performance we're wanting to handle via a key hierarchy, roughly, I think is what we're saying is we want to experiment. Observability, we want to handle in a few places. We want extra data coming in from the API server. We want a better storage format. And we want the reference implementation to just have a really high bar for just the data that it 
keeps around or emits and then can be integrated with. What are we doing for recovery? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Okay. Well, what is exactly the recovery problem we want to solve? Uh, so like if one of, if the key is lost basically, and then how do we decrypt the data? Like the list API fails. If you do keep still get secrets, if there is even a single, uh, single secret that's encrypted with the old key, then it's unrecoverable, but then it also fails your other requests. So how can we delete that? Like get rid of it. Today, there is no user API where they can do it. And we also don't want to do it automatically on the back end because it's a risky. So the only way today is they hop into the HCD node and then go and delete it directly from HCD with. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think so far the consensus I've heard is basically the API server cannot handle storage level issues. Just as it cannot handle etcd being down, it cannot handle the KMS plugin getting into a state that is wonky and unexpected. Uh, I think the easiest solution here is like, we just have to admit that they would have to delete the keys. Like there is no way they can recover them if they don't have like the key. If they deleted it, like there is no way they can recover their secret or whatever they, they stored. And based on that, like we can then build some alerting. Like let's say we introduce metrics to say that um, there are some errors uh, getting like data from the storage because um, we couldn't decrypt them. If like these errors like accumulate, then we can emit an alert that would tell like the administrator that, hey, um, there is something wrong. Like I cannot decrypt the data in DPA server. You need to do something. And then they can check like whether they have the key or not. And if they don't have it, then we guide them to like, what are the etcd command that can be made to delete all the data that they have to kind of like put the API server back in shape. Is there maybe some post-mortem where, where some company ran into issues with, with, um, the, with KMS and the whole, the whole storage was encrypted and they had issues reaching the keys. Maybe there are some real life examples where we would see, okay, this is happening, people really need it. Um, otherwise, I would hope that infrastructure as a code magic make, makes it easier to recover from such an issue. The, the other thought I had around this is, um, so I agree with basically everything Damon said, which is that we, we should make it clear that the problem exists and guide towards a human being making the final decision for what their options are. Uh, presumably before they do anything, they back up everything and then start deleting stuff instead of the other order. Uh, um, do, do we think that, let me rephrase that, should we invest effort within the KMS plugins or APIs or whatever uh, in having some concept of a lease? So that way, at least in the environments where deleting a key has concepts of leasing the key, I think some of the cloud providers do. Should we should we try to build that in somehow in a way that makes it less likely that a key would be accidentally deleted? Right. Obviously, administrator can always force delete something, and it's sort of out of our hand, right? Just as you can like nuke the, you know, you can tell your hardware. I need you to like internally nuke the key that you have and just generate another one, right? Well, the old key is gone. There's no getting it back, right? It's like lot left. It's it's left the system. I mean, that's a very good point. And I think like with key hierarchy, we could make that really easy for us because like we would now be in more like we would have more control about like the lease of the key basically because like we own the 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 local KEK. and then we can say like that every one hour the plugin will check uh, against the KMS if it can, for example, just decrypt uh, the, the local KEK that we have. Um, and then like, just like try to see if the KEK that is linked to this local KEK still exists. And if it doesn't, then we put a list of like, I don't know, 24 hours before like we kind of remove the local KEK where like the administrator needs to do something like either change the like pull out to a new key or migrate the storage or whatever. 
but we have like way more control since now like all the encryption depends on the local KK and not the KK. Anish, uh, I don't know. I, I'm not that familiar with the different like vault APIs. Like is in like in Azure's key vault, is there is there some concept of a lease? Can you can you no, say that you're using a key? Uh, you, I mean, so there is this concept where even if you delete a key, it's recoverable, but it, there is no lease, like where you say you can't delete this key. Um, I mean, there's nothing blocking the delete, basically. Mm. So if you delete it, it's recoverable for like seven days. So like that correlates with lease, because if someone accidentally deletes it, it's almost saying like, hey, this was supposed to be used, so you can still go and recover it for the next seven days. But yes, there is no way to block it from being deleted. Okay, but if it's deleted, but still recoverable, so it was deleted less than seven days ago, I assume you cannot use it for operations anymore. So at least that, would, that, that is something that's detectable, like in a similar way to what Damien just said, right? If, is that if you tried to use that, like, you know, you were like, hey, I have this local key encryption key. I know it was attached to my key vault ID seven. Mm -hmm. and I'm trying to ask for this to be decrypted by key vault ID seven. And the key vault is saying there's no ID seven anymore. You know that seems like you know, something that we could try to understand and build as at least a metric or something, but maybe not as a. Yeah, I, I get. I guess I. What, what I was sort of magically hoping for was there was some capability of saying that like when this plugin is running, it it will basically maybe do an encryption operation or something like that with a particular key just at some interval as a way of saying, hey, I still need that key. You can't delete it. Like you like have to like turn me off. And like, then like, you know, like my, you know, like my dead man switch is off now and then you can go delete the key, right? But like you, you can't do it in some other weird order. Um, but yeah, if, but if that's really that, so like some kind of rotation mechanism. So let's say that they want to delete a key like for some security reasons. Um, and like we have this KMS plugin that is still using it. So they cannot really like do that anymore because like we have this list mechanism. Um, but like if they really want to delete it, they would have to have a way to migrate the whole, like all the data to the new key. So that like the previous one is not used anymore. It's like we would still go back to like the migration problem where we need to find some ways for the KMS to tell the KMS plugin that there is a new key and that a migration needs to be, needs to happen. Yeah, so definitely it sounds like a very nice feature. So for security or when you're rotating and you don't know, have 100 keys and, and your cloud provider chat starts freezing in charge for, for that amount of keys. Um, but is this really a feature that, so even though it's a really nice feature, would it make sense we um, postpone it to a later version? Or can we tackle that, mu that much com complexity on, on the first go? Just from what like Inish just said, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical that it can even be done, like in, in, in the way I'd imagined it. I, I, I think what Damien said can be done, which is you can observe if the system has gotten into a state where the only reason the system is healthy is because you happen to have in memory the mm -hmm. like the decrypted key encryption key so you're okay right now but you're like if the plugin was restarted you would not be okay so you can detect that state and that's nice right that gives you like a little like it gives you you know imagine if you were using a local file based encryption and you accidentally like deleted the files that had the keys in them while the API server is running, you're still technically okay because the keys are in memory, right? It gives you that kind of state, but with the KMS plugin, right? You can get into a state where the cloud provider key or your hardware key is gone, but you're still technically kind of okay for a little while. Um, um, but I don't necessarily see us a future state where you can get beyond uh, the uh, the other than the aspect of understanding that 
you have observed this particular failure mode and can try to provide guidance. I don't, I don't see a way of preventing the failure mode because it requires the key vault itself to have a concept of this key is in use. You can't delete it right now because the system is saying it's in use, right? It's kind of like that annoying Windows thing where you try to delete a file and it's like, no, you can't. Like this file, this pro this this program has it open, and then you're like, screw you! I still want to delete the file, right? Like. <laughs> Uh, um, but yeah, I, there, there is no lease, but I think, yeah, the one that Damien suggested, we can definitely do that. Like, I think one other topic that probably is in one of the sections in observability is the health check. And I think we also talked about it, right? Do we want to have a dedicated health check API and let KMS plugins do whatever they want to for, as part of health check and return a response? And I think we do, right? And this could be basically what our hierarchy based plugin does is right. Like it checks to make sure this hierarchy is still viable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and at the end, it, like it will still require, like we cannot really take action based on like whatever happened. Like we can notice that the key was deleted, but like as a plugin or even in DPSR, so, like we cannot really take action because we don't know like what is the new key. We don't know if we need to do a migration or whatever. Like the best thing we can do is just like notify the administrator that there is something that came up that is really, really critical and they need to look into it as um, So like actually one, one thing, if, you're, if you get into a case where you have an in-memory sub-key encryption key, but you cannot, um, uh, you cannot, if you also had like, so this is a little weird, like so you, if you had the encrypted version of it and you asked the KMS to decrypt it and it couldn't, because you, if you had the in-memory version of it, the unencrypted version, at that instant, you could immediately try to make a new in-memory key and ask the cloud provider to encrypt it. And if that operation works, now you have a new key encryption key that you could do rotation with in like a desperate attempt to be like, I need, I need to like re-encrypt yeah. this new key right now because the old one is no longer viable, but I happen to have it in RAM. Um, that could be interesting, right? That is that yeah. is kind of like a very nuanced case of automatic rotation, right? It's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, um, this is really cool. So so there was this platform called Keybase, I think it still exists, yeah. where it's where it's at the end encrypted. As long as one device is still kind of connected and somehow has uh, the keys for your account in memory, like like especially on your smartphone, you have this in, in the secure storage then you could kind of re revive or, or share the keys with other uh, devices and reset password and, and magic like that. Okay, uh, I do need to drop a little bit early. Um, I think we can maybe continue with any of our other discussions offline. Um, I, I, I kind of got the sense that all of like recovery is sort of like maybe like a hand baby thing in the future, but I think we're looking at performance and observability really through the lens of new API changes, new storage formats, and a new reference implementation. Like we feel like I think we can address all of those pretty cohesively with those three things basically. Uh, yeah. So, which is exciting. That means, you know, like we're, we're like sort of coalescing on an approach, uh, which I'm excited about. Uh, Okay, so one question. Um, let me pause the recording.